So one thing that's really exciting about what you're doing with the reactor, it's called Aurora, is that you guys actually can reuse existing nuclear fuel. I guess we can take stuff that's in existing nuclear power plants, it's been used from them, and, it, and, it's, and it's waste now, and, and we could use that to power the United States for how many years? Yeah, for over 100 years. So we have over 100 years of ability to power the United States just using the nuclear waste we already have. Yeah. With no extra carbon output or anything. None. It's amazing, right? This is a vast energy reserve that we think of as a waste right now. I'm Joe Lonsdale. Welcome to American Optimist. We're really excited to welcome today Jake DeWitt, the founder and CEO of Aqua, which is a nuclear energy company. Thank you for having me. Jake, you grew up in New Mexico. Let's talk a bit about your background to start. I, I, I remember hearing you, you visited the National Nuclear Science Museum as a kid. What, what inspired you to get involved in, in nuclear power? Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of those things where I grew up, like you said, around this stuff. And that's one of the cool things about growing up in New Mexico. And as a result of being around all of this technology, all of these kind of cool exhibits in these museums, going to very frequently, you become pretty captivated, at least I did, by this technology that seemed like it was out of science fiction, but was actually used in the sense that like, hey, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, we discovered how to move from the electron shell to the nucleus of the atom in terms of harnessing the energy there. And when you do that, it's a multi-million fold change. Um, and, you know, it seems like you get this thing that should be in sci-fi, but in practice we actually have. And so I was just fascinated at a very young age. And the thing that stuck with me is why aren't we doing more of this? This seems like a natural step in technological progression. We should be doing this. So where'd you go to school? So yeah, University of Florida for undergrad and then MIT for my uh, master's and PhD. What, what was your PhD in at MIT? Nuclear engineering. Awesome. So you have a PhD in nuclear engineering. What's the conceptual gap in the market between what was going on in the nuclear world and what led you to want to found Oclo? Like what, what weren't they doing? Yeah, that's a really kind of interesting journey to think about retrospectively. Um, you know, the thing that got me was why didn't we have more of it? That was the root question. Like, why wasn't this the dominant source of energy we had given its superior advantages? And when you back up at the highest level, when you think about the amount of materials that are required to make energy levelized over its life cycle, nuclear requires the least. So it should be the cheapest and the most sustainable just because it uses the least materials. But we weren't really realizing that with new plants. And so that begged me to kind of, or drove me to really think about why and, and what's going on in this space. And that led to kind of a realization that, you know, the industry had sort of locked in old ways of doing things, kind of got stuck in a status quo and was really under realizing the potential of the technology um, to the point where it was like, hey, there's so much opportunity to just think about this differently and try to approach this from a more modern angle because it was kind of stuck in the past. When I spent more time growing up and working in the national labs, working at different companies, going to grad school, um, I realized too how much things were sort of locked in a way of doing things because that's the way they had been done for decades. And there was, this it feels really dangerous to change how things are done, I guess, in an area where there's nuclear meltdowns or something. I think, I think more of it is actually, you know, you think about what's going on at the time, there's kind of this brain drain in the field in the, in the early seventies to late seventies, early eighties, where you had some really smart people who got into it, were really excited about the technology, but then left because things were stagnating for various reasons on the regulatory side on on sort of the policy side. On my, the my, my father used side. to tell me about the regulation. He was uh, uh, at Raychem, which is a big heat tracing company, and they sold all sorts of industrial plants. And, and in the eighties, when he sold to nuclear plants, they had to have binders and binders and binders of stuff that just didn't make any sense to him. Like it was definitely was not improving the safety, but it was almost, he said it was almost if someone had purposely put in millions of pages of regulation to try to hurt the technology. That was his view. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And a lot of that honestly was oddly self-imposed by the industry because there's this tendency to be like, oh, well, let's just keep doing what's been done before and add on more things. It's just easier to keep our well, heads down. Well, I guess down. the industry who are already there put in tons of rules. It makes it really hard for anyone else. This is something we talk about, like if BlackRock makes it so you'd have to pay lawyers $300 million to do what they're doing, no startup's going to be able to pay the lawyers $300 million. They're not going to get challenged. So it may have been actually in a way to entrench themselves as well. Yeah, in a weird way, I don't think it was that deliberate. I think it was more just like this passive response to a lack of thinking about, I mean, think about utilities. They don't really have a big incentive to innovate. They just want to work in the sort of world that, that just keeps something running. It's an operational just want to be mindset. very careful. I guess the people running these companies are probably process-driven bureaucrats. Yes. And they want to just put more and more processes in because that's their job. Right, exactly, exactly. As yes. Americans, we kind of want there to be some processes because, again, there's this fear of nuclear power. And we, we say, okay, let's be really careful. Yeah. Let's have lots of processes. There's obviously, you, you, want, you obviously want to be careful somewhat, but then I guess there's an argument if you have so many ridiculous things, you don't rethink it, then it, then it could it make it un, 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 uneconomical. Yeah, and, and also locks in older less efficient and frankly, not as safe technology. So what was, so what was this gap 
between like what was less safe and what was less efficient and what you're doing now? Yeah. So the big thing we saw was we've built this massive inertia of millions of pages of effectively regulatory guidance is what it's called. Basically recommendations on how to meet the regulations, which mind you are maybe a hundred pages or so. Um, but you've built millions of pages all driven around the large existing power plants we have today because, and it, and it wasn't about, it wasn't really built from a design side. It was built on just continuing to operate these things the same way it's been done before with this creep of, of regulations and creep of process like like we were talking about. Um, what we saw was there's in parallel to that going on sort of in the commercialization stages, the U.S. had been building and testing all sorts of different reactor types and showing some worked really, really well. But they hadn't, they were behind the curve in commercialization, although the technology was basically demonstrated. So there are new reactors that worked, so they couldn't commercialize. Well, and and was, right. it, was it because the regulation was too hard? Is it because there's too much to get the financing? What was it? Yeah, it was a mix of those things because these technologies were generally improvements. Uh, and open the door for more efficient, you know, you're talking about inherent passive safety mechanisms. And that's a bad way of saying it. It's really putting safety into the design inherently and intrinsically. So the design would be such that it couldn't melt down as easily. Right. And so you, you make it so that like, it's self-stabilizing. So if it heats up, it shuts itself down. Um, it's always self-controlling. You're able to move heat with natural forces. So just the natural circulation of air, other forces like convection and conduction. And, and, and these new, better safety ways, more efficient safety things, we're not getting into the designs. They were in the designs, but the problem was taking that, getting it through the regulatory process and matching the business models to do this. So they weren't actually getting built. Right. Was it also because nothing was getting built or was it, were there things being built in the old stupider way? It was m mostly not much getting built at all. And, and the things and, that were, were the old kind the of things that were, were the old dumber ways. And the thing that was hard was you have, you had, you had a mix of kind of an approach, especially at the industry level, wanting to take these new technologies that are inherently different, but then regulate them the same way these of, uh, as these much bigger, older plants. This is, this is, this is a huge problem in lots of areas. We talked, we talked earlier to Sal Churi who's you know, investing in icon, which is, which is basically like trying to build houses with 3d printing and you have to have completely different regulatory infrastructure to build them that way versus building the other way. So this is a similar case here. Yeah. And, and what was interesting to us was when we saw this, we saw, Hey, the regulations themselves actually give a pretty clear path to do this. You have to just get out of the mindset of keeping doing things according to this guidance that had built up. That was, and, and I'll dive into that for a second. What regulatory guidance is, is the staff at the nuclear regulatory commission, the, the, the permitting and licensing entity in the U S um, they wrote like millions of pages of guidance on how to meet the recommendation or regulations based on large existing power plants. But in the, what we'd seen historically, what kept these technologies on the shelf in many ways was these new technologies that were inherently different, inherently simpler. They, could, they, they couldn't go along with the millions of pages of guidance documents because they had a whole different solution for doing it. Right. Well, and, and that was the thing is they kept trying to force that, but there's no way it didn't make sense. It was square peg round hole. Just and, so, didn't and so, and so, so, so what have you done here? That's gotten around these million pages of misguided guidance documents. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we looked and asked the question, why don't we just do it differently? Why don't we just go straight to the regulations and realize that we should license this thing in a manner that's reflective of the actual safety characteristics of the system, according to the regulatory requirements. So you went straight and you, and you went and you, and you convinced you, I think you're the first advanced vision company to have a combined license application accepted by the U S nuclear regulatory commission. Yes. So you're, you're, you're here. It's accepted. Like what, what is it? What, what did they accept? Tell us, tell us about the design. Yeah. What are the improvements? Yeah. So starting at the design level, what it is, is a, it's, it's what's called a liquid metal cooled fast reactor. And what that means is we use liquid metal as the coolant, uh, which is phenomenally Liquid metal cooling. sounds hot to me. Yeah, it is hot. Um, and it's also really, really good at cooling, uh, like significantly so, better so than water. So it's really hot, but this thing's even hotter and it's cooling it down. Yeah, basically you take fuel that's in metallic form. So it's an alloy of uranium zirconium. Um, and then the fuel, heat is produced by fission. Let's, let's, there's an alloy of what kind of zirconium? Uh, just zirconium and uranium. Zirconium and uranium. That The uranium obviously is a thing that's, that's, that's the fissile material. Yep. And this, it gets really hot when it's when it's going through fission. Yeah, and so, so it you, needs this liquid metal around it to cool it. Exactly. So that heat produced in the fuel by fission, which, mind you, a fission a reaction when you split an atom, it releases about fifty million times more energy than when you combust, for example, a fossil fuel. I mean, that's a so this ridiculous is a, this competitive is a lot, advantage. This is a lot, <laughs> a lot more energy than anything coming out of an internal combustion engine. Yeah, that's why you can take a golf ball of uranium and power your life with it. That's what's so cool about this technology. And so, like, you've got that in front of you, and this what what happens is is you know you're able to split the atoms, get the heat into the fuel. The heat then is conducted out to the coolant, which is then removed. The coolant's this liquid metal. And how big is the whole thing? Yeah. So the whole plant is, you know, uh, depending on the size range, cause you can go up to a couple, you know, a couple different size points in power output, but on the order of, you know, a few thousand square feet to, you know, 15,000 square feet. Wow. So this is relatively small. It's relatively small. 
Yeah. So, so a few thousand square feet is, and, and you, would you bury this or what, what do you do with it? Yeah. So you, you, you dig a hole, you basically put in the reactor module, which we call where you have the react, where we have the things we just talked about, the fuel, the vessel, all those, the tanks. Um, and then next to that, but on the, above the ground, you put the stuff that actually makes electricity, which is a, a you know, turbine spinning a generator. Part of the reason we designed the building to look in a, a, a different manner and look kind of cool and, and it changed kind of that paradigm is we want it to be inviting to folks. I mean, I would love to live on top of not just I'd love to live in in the building like I would love that if that was possible that's um, cool you'd have in your basement or yeah I mean it'd be big you need the right sizing for it but yeah. if I have a really big basement in Texas where you have big basements can I put one of these in my basement you could yeah how many years until until we get to there I, honestly I don't think we're that far I don't think we're that far. It depends where you live and the population. My HOA neighbors. might not allow, but assuming the HOA allows it, maybe, yeah. maybe five years. Yeah, it, it would take about that long. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and then you can provide power to your neighbors in the HOA. So they might like you a lot, actually. <laughs> that, that could be cool. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the Aurora Powerhouse. This yeah. is what we're calling this uh, cool looking reactor. We'll put a picture on the screen. Uh, so first of all, how small is it compared to gigawatt reactors? You said it's a few thousand, it could be as small as a few thousand square feet, but you might get yeah. 15,000. So if you think about what we're doing here, we can build plants up to about 15 megawatts in size, sorry, 15. So we can build plants up to 15 megawatts in size. Um, the Aurora that we're building, the first one is one and a half megawatts. Uh, it's our first commercial plant going in Idaho. Uh, it's in a building about 4,500 square feet, mm -hmm. has an A-frame design and aesthetic around it, um, largely to, to you know reflect uh, sort of the, a different approach and a different styling of the system in the building. Also functionally designed because it's actually pretty easy to build these things. How much, how much does the building cost? If you're going to do 10 of these buildings, what would it cost to scale to make these buildings? Oh, I mean, uh, in, you know, if you put the reactor inside of it, kind of depends a little bit on the exact siting and how much work needs to go into it, but somewhere between 30 and $40 million, 30 and 40 so. million for 1.5 megawatt reactor. So, and how long does it, does it operate after you build it? Yeah. So you can run them for 10 to 20 years, depending on, do you uh, refuel it during that time yeah. or, so fuel, one load of fuel can last one you up to fuel 20 years. goes up to 20 years. And, and so the, the effective cost over that 20 years is about three cents, you said? So those, are, that, that smaller range, it's a little more expensive. But if you move that to the 15 megawatt size range, then yeah, you can get the prices down to sort of below four, four or five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and, uh, so and if we tax carbon, powerful. this could be especially efficient. Yeah, and even if you don't, I mean, I think the broad thing here is when you think about competitive advantages, we're starting with a technology that's inherently millions of times better than the alternatives. What do people pay in different places right now per kilowatt hour? <laughs> well, here in California, we have the lovely joy of paying at peak hours. We, I mean, our last electric bill came in, peak hours were 40 to 42 cents a kilowatt hour. 42 cents at peak hours. is insane. This is basically when the wind's not blowing, the windmill's here or whatever, they charge you a hell of a lot more. Yeah, well, honestly, it's even in the middle of the, the, the late part of the day or the, when the sun when is they, still when shining. When you need AC or, sun, or people come home and using it. 40, over 40 yeah. cents. And so you could, you could reliably at scale be doing something from the order of four cents for a tenth as much as the peaks. Yep. Wow. And, and this is, I guess this is just like, it's, it's reliable. It's just, it's just run for 20 years or so without turning off. I mean, you'll turn it off uh, occasionally for servicing different parts of it. But it, you're talking about a system that's going to be up and operational more than 98% of the time, or at least has the potential to be. So it's pretty I guess flexible. you could do a couple of these in a big area and, and every once in a while one will go off during yeah. the, when you have to do it. So if you think about like a factory, for example, or a data center that wants reliable power, you probably build two of these. So that way, if you take one down for service, the other still providing power. That makes sense. And so nuclear is really scary to a lot of people. I'm not as scared of nuclear, but, but I empathize with them given the stories we're told. They're, they're worried that like, you know, the Simpsons fish is going to swim by and have a third eye and their kids are going to become, you know, mutants with X-Men powers. Like, like, first of all, like what's the radiation danger on these? Yeah. When it's operating, I mean, that's one of the things you design it so that there's none, right. When you're, when you're talking about, what do you mean operating. there's none, there's, there's, there's a, there's a, fission reaction going on is atom splitting. That's going to shoot out radiation. Yeah. Where's it going to go? It gets, it gets blocked and shielded intentionally. So, so it can't, so it can't, it can't get out of the concrete. No. So it's all shielded by materials you have in there, things that absorb radiation, all that very much, you know, intentionally. And then the cool thing about that is in, yeah, you can like, there's places you don't go because it's too hot and there's too much radiation. You wouldn't want to like stick your hand into the steel. Yeah. You're not going to like get liquid, into that liquid, liquid metal. There's alloy. a lot of barriers for you doing that anyway. So no, of course. But it. what if, what if like a crazy terrorist these days that we were supposed to talk about uh, white male nationalists? What if one of them comes? I'm just joking, sorry. And he goes and he blows it up. Like 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 what what happens? Yeah. Well, this is the interesting thing. So if you put the physics of safety on your side, what does that mean? So really quickly, that means you're able to keep things controlled, keep things cooled, and most importantly, you really keep everything contained. So all the stuff that's radioactive, you keep contained. And that's what you have to design a plant to do to get regulatory approval. And that includes looking at these kinds of external threats or hazards. Um, and so you can build a system and design a system 
that has a lot of parts needed to do that. Or you can design a system that simplistically does that through kind of natural forces and natural mm -hmm. means. And that's what we did. And the cool thing about that is that then trims all that paperwork that you're just talking so about. It, so what's the with. natural mean that, that makes this, makes this not like, how does something else go critical and this doesn't go critical? Yeah. So what it really is, is, is that the right word? Go critical? Kind of. Yeah. So going critical means it's, it's, it's running, right? It's just, that's the self-sustaining chain reaction. Yep. Okay. Um, the thing that you, and it's, it's okay if a plant stays critical as well, it's, it's supposed about, to while it's putting out electricity. Right. And even if you lose things, it's okay if it stays critical, as long as you can keep it cooled because critical ultimately ties to being able to produce some amount of heat. Although you, what's cool about nuclear stuff is, you know, you can be critical and not produce any heat or meaningless heat. Anyway, typically what happens in a power reactor, you're producing meaningful heat because that's how you, that's what the main point is. You're producing heat that helps you produce power. Right. And then if something goes wrong, the idea is that, okay, the system is able to basically keep cool and keep controlled by natural means so that nothing overheats and things stay contained. And the way this really works is a pretty simple process. We talked about what the fuel looks like. And, uh, you know, <laughs> when things heat up, they expand, which is a cool, you know, natural phenomena that we kind of are used to seeing sometimes. Yep. Uh, but what that does for an, in a reactor system like ours, is that actually causes more neutrons, right? The things that are actually sustaining this, this reaction that are causing fission, more of them to leave the reactor fuel and get absorbed in those shielding around it that stops radiation. Well, that means that the neutrons are not continuing the reaction. So the way the reaction normally works when is that, is that it gets going and these neutrons get sh shot out and then they keep the reaction going by adding kind of any energy to it. Yeah. So basically the neutrons go there. They're born when you split an atom in fission, you release two to three neutrons. Those go on. Some of them cause fission and other atoms nearby. Some just get absorbed in other things in the system. But as long as you have one from each generation causing fission in the next, that's a system being critical. Yep. And so in this case, as things heat up, fewer than one cause fission. Uh, in the next generation. So the power goes down, it goes down quite quickly. So you have a system that sort of automatically matches cooling. It's automatically adjusts itself naturally. Exactly. So whereas, whereas what would the old system potentially do? Yeah. In the old system, you had a lot more parts to, to sort of realize that. And the other part of it is, is, is it just naturally, but it also keeps itself cool naturally. So how's that? Basically what's really cool about this is, is the natural forces of basically gravity and thermal expansion of the coolant and buoyancy, right? We know hot water, hot air rises, the same thing here, hot liquid metal rises. And then as it does so, it pulls other coolant behind it and that coolant removes the heat because it's flowing. So it's naturally pulling in coolant to cool it down if it gets to be too hot. Right, and then the air is just, and then, then from there outside of the fuel, that coolant while it gets hotter, then transfers its heat through those vessels or those tanks I described, where it's just not the natural flow so of air. So this is basically a superior it. design just to naturally cut off any kind of runaway reactions. Right, and then in, in today's plants, you have a lot of extra systems that are in place to manage all that heat. And in our case, it's just the fact that the air flows naturally around the system and moves the heat. And that allows you to simplify things tremendously. And, and, and have, you, have you tested this out yet? Well, that's the cool thing. This has been built and done before. So everything I'm talking about, the physics of how this works, has actually been proven. So uh, back in the 1960s, they built a reactor uh, it called EBR2, not the best name, but EBR2 in Idaho. It ran for 30 years, and it demonstrated these amazing safety characteristics. In fact, on April 3rd, 1986, they put it through these phenomenal, like, basically full-scale safety system tests where they challenged this thing in, in crazy difficult ways. They ran it at full power. They locked the control rods out, the things that go in and shut it down. They locked them out of the reactor so they couldn't go in. And then they shut off all the cooling to the system. Wow. And the system naturally did what we expected it to. It heated up, it expanded, it shut itself down, and it naturally established that sort of natural circulation and was able to remove all the heat. So, so why didn't they then just start using this more back then? Yeah, so you have that amazing thing happen. And then what happened was you kind of have that match of, okay, we know this stuff works and this is a phenomenal safety characteristic. Mind you, it also did these really cool things where it was able to produce power at three cents a kilowatt hour and uh, it recycled its own waste. So really cool what you can do on that front. But then you move this thing forward and say, okay, well, why didn't it get to market? And that was one of the questions that really stuck with me looking at this field. And there were a couple of things that really stood out. One was, you know, the regulatory side where you had a regulatory in sort of infrastructure and institution all built for older reactors. And you also had a business model and an industry that was largely dependent on the government to fund it and needed to actually take and take the time to really develop a different regulatory approach. And that appetite wasn't really there, especially because the government funding had very little interest in sort of doing something new. Like so that. What, what have you done to improve on the design from yeah. almost 60 years ago now? So what the trend line was, was taking that design and, and sort of maximizing the amount of power you get from it. What we did is say that doesn't, the, the, you end up focusing on just a small part of the system 
to sort of make it as small as possible, but then in turn you make all these other parts of the system a lot bigger. So you kind of have a big trade off there that, that gets lost in the shuffle at times. Our thought was how do we think about this more globally from the whole building size, the whole facility size, and make it all as simple and, and sort of small as reasonably possible. And uh, in doing so, we actually reduce that power density, the amount of power we try to pack in the fuel. And that allows us to simplify all these other things. And that's what then allows us to say, okay, great, we have a simpler design. Now we can go take that to the regulatory side and, and develop a regulatory methodology a way to meet the regulatory requirements uh, that that basically reflects the so design. Big, par big part of being uh, an entrepreneur in the nuclear area these days is what can work for regulatory and safety and to scale throughout the United States. Yeah. And being willing to actually do something different in the regulatory side. And that was a big thing for us. Nobody had done that. We submitted, we developed this license application um, and we, we took, <laughs> It was interesting. So when we started, there was kind of this idea that people were increasingly recognizing the importance of nuclear. So it was catching some attention and there was some realization, oh, like these advanced technologies are great, but nobody can license them. And our view was like, no, we can. The question isn't about can we license them, it's about can we do it efficiently and effectively. And what we saw was this tendency, everyone wanted to just do things the same way it had been done. And we said, no, let's do it fundamentally differently and better. So one thing that's really exciting about what you're doing with the reactor, it's called Aurora, is that you guys actually can reuse existing nuclear fuel. I guess we can take stuff that's in existing nuclear power plants, has been used from them, and, it, and, it's, and it's waste now. And, and we could use that to power the United States for how many years? Yeah, for over 100 years. So we have over 100 years of ability to power the United States just using the nuclear waste we already have. Yeah. With no extra carbon output or anything. None. It's amazing, right? This is a vast energy reserve that we think of as a waste right now, as something that's a liability, as something that people are sometimes afraid of. And in practice, with these advanced technologies, like what we're doing, it's called a fast reactor. The reason we call it a fast reactor is because when you when you split an atom, the neutrons you release, which typically are two to three each time that happens, uh, they're born going pretty fast, a couple percent of the speed of light, right? Um, but in today's reactors, we slow them down uh, bouncing them off things like water, the hydrogen and water, and that makes them easier to be absorbed, caught, if you will, yep. by atoms and fuel. Um, great, you need less fuel as a result. Fast reactors, you don't slow them down. You let them run as they're born fast, which means they're harder to catch. You need a little more fuel, but because they're going faster, they're carrying more energy, and that allows you to much more efficiently actually split atoms that form a significant part of the waste profile, which are these things beyond uranium in the periodic table. We call them transuranic actinides. So, so there's tran transuranic actinides that can only be split by these fast neutrons. Right. So you're able to actually use waste more efficiently than others. Yeah. So what are the biggest objections to what you're doing? A lot of people, they're just, a lot of people are just negative on nuclear and say, oh, it doesn't work and it's too expensive and it's too dangerous. Like, but, but what, 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 what are the, what are, like steal me on the objections for me. Like what are the smart yeah. objections to what you're doing? Yeah. Well, I think one of the interesting things, you know, is, I mean, the economic side and the timeline side are some things that people bring up. The interesting thing to me is the people that bring those up are the people who also actively work to make those more expensive and harder. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so the, the same people who are trying to regulate this to make it impossible yeah. are saying, oh, you can't do it because it's it's so regulated and it takes so long. Yep. And then they just try to keep and they're making like, it let's make the regulations harder. really hard. Right. Well, where are they coming from on this? You know, it's it's an interesting background of, I think, old, antiquated, very outdated views of the technology that's that's often just tied to some Cold War era like Chernobyl. thinking. Chernobyl. They think Chernobyl and they're afraid. Yeah. And I don't even, you know, I think it's, yeah, it's really tied to this kind of emotive response based in uh, experiences from decades ago. Um, and I find what people are realizing more and more, and I think what's really exciting is more and more people are realizing the importance that nuclear provides in terms of reliability of power, which I think more and more people are recognizing, but also clean, which it's reliable. It's clean while. to me. If someone believes that global warming is a big challenge and then, they, and then they haven't looked, they don't believe in nuclear. It seems like maybe they're not serious about the global warming. Right. Stuff. I mean, it's, and that's, what's, that's, what's kind of encouraging right now is we've had a shift where, you know, I think you see some of the policymakers, you know, climate change gets treated as this, this political football It's always really weird when you have people who sometimes would talk about climate change as if, uh, it was the big existential threat, but then be not supportive of nuclear plants or sh wanting to shut them down. Or you have people who, who wouldn't recognize climate change really happening, but then be big supporters of nuclear. It was a very interesting dynamic, but now that's kind of bridged across. And I think this is one of those areas where there's huge bipartisan support right now, which is really exciting. What, it, what, what are the polling numbers? Like what percentage of people support this time technology right now. And, and if they, obviously if we educate them, it'll probably go up, but like, but what yeah. is it right now? You know, I, oh man, the latest polling, I, I actually don't know off the top of my head. It um, seems like it's the majority these days. It is though, the majority. Which was not the case in the seventies. People not were freaked all. out about this stuff. Exactly. It's really changed. It is the majority. I mean, the information age to use a silly term has, has really opened up the opportunity for people to learn. One of the really interesting things I thought that happened and kind of anecdotally, but, but what we observed was after that show Chernobyl came out, I was worried at first because it was like, oh man, people are 
are going to see this and then have all these misconceptions and it's probably going to be a horribly done show that was fully inaccurate. And it was actually better than I thought. There's still inaccuracies. But um, the thing that was interesting to me was a lot of people then took the takeaway from that is, wow, communism and the Soviet Union were awful. Yes. Uh, and it's like, yeah. Which is a good takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, and then they were like, and nuclear power, like that thing was crazy up in Chernobyl, but that's really, really cool what it does. It's like really important because they, they're able to actually look up the facts, right? Because that's, that's available today. In short summary, Chernobyl was people managing it, screwing up in multiple crazy ways. Oh man. Yeah. You have like a terrible system in place where you, you know, an autocratically dictatorial system on running the plants, um, poor choices and technology that were old and rushed forward. Um, ironically, like quotas in place for before May day, um, to rush testing so that you had inexperienced staff running a test in a bad manner. And that's when everything, you know, got out of control. Just a lot of things combined that were wrong with systematic old, failures with an old design that yep. was, that was much more easily able to have, have trouble. Yeah. And largely, and if you think about it, there were other plants like that that did operate fine. So it was mostly a symptom of human error. Um, largely as a Although no one wants human error to be able to lead something that crazy, which is partially why you've designed this now that even if yeah. humans screw up, this thing, this thing shuts itself down. Yeah. And it's interesting, right? When you design a system like that, you minimize the things people can even do with it, which is a great thing because human error typically has kind of a limit in terms of how you know, it, it ends up being the problem. Um, especially when you put physics on your side, things like gravity don't just randomly turn off. Um, so part of the reason we started the American optimist is to push back against the cynicism and pessimism. Uh, there's just all sorts of people saying, Oh, I don't want to have kids because the future of the world's going to be dystopian and the environment's going to be broken. And, uh, obviously Oclo as this like really exciting nuclear technology that could run the whole country for a hundred years, just on waste power and is, is extremely safe. It seems like it should be giving people some optimism. Like, 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 is, like how should we be like, how should people be thinking about Oclo and like what's possible for the future of our country? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing because we have this technology that's been done before. And the question really is scaling this. This is an inevitability. Like at the end of the day, the shift towards clean energy, the shift towards affordable and reliable power, all of those things are happening for various reasons that are ultimately driving, I think, a better planet at the outcome because you combine cleaner air and water with energy abundance that's also affordable and reliable. I mean, that's everything, right? That's everything. And you think about the fundamental determinant. I, I can't say the fundamental, but one of the main determinants in, in human quality of life is the access to energy. And so if we can bring that forward in a way that's sustainable and clean, which is what we're working to do with our technology, like you fix those problems. Actually, I was flying uh, on the plane the other day and looked down and we saw one of those giant solar farms that has like the tower in the middle. It looks yeah. really cool, but it made me think, you know, there's a tremendous attention on renewable energy, but it just takes a huge amount of land to have a low carbon future with wind and with solar. Tell us a little bit about like how much space you need for power output, and, you know, for, versus these other technologies. Yeah, it's it's one of the really cool things about nuclear is, you know, by and large, you can use 10 to 100, 100 times less land uh, to make the energy that you would otherwise get from other sources, um, which is pretty powerful. And advanced vision only becomes even more sustainable. So those numbers even go smaller. So it's a it's a pretty phenomenal effective land use uh, kind of sustainability perspective. I think you gave us a chart. It said 250,000 acres of wind is the same as 150,000 acres of solar is like, is what? It's is like, like a thousand or less uh, acres of uh, nuclear. nuclear yeah. In some cases, I think for, with advanced reactors, that number drops, you know, maybe into the hundreds. It depends a little bit on specific siting and configurations, but yeah, and it's just a huge, huge difference. Um, and the other cool thing about it is, is the material intensiveness. Like we think oftentimes, you know, about, oh, okay, Nuclear plants are these big systems that we see today and advanced systems are going to be different and smaller. But at the end of the day, nuclear today and nuclear in the future, even even more so, uses the least materials. Yeah, people don't realize that to build this solar and these wind farms, you're putting out ridiculous amounts of carbon, tons of money. Yeah. And you say it's actually going to be a lot less intensive on the environment to build the nuclear plants. Yeah. So. And people, sometimes this is one of the, the interesting criticisms that people sometimes bring up is like, oh, well, nuclear is not zero carbon in the life cycle. Well, I think at the end of the day, we're probably going to be electrifying most of the equipment and mining and construction. So yeah, you'll get there. But even before that, when you're talking about a fuel source that's millions of times more energy dense than anything else, that's going to be the best way to be most efficient. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be the best way to be zero carbon. If the least materials needed, it's of course going to have the least, uh, the lowest carbon footprint. And, so. and, there, and there's enough of this material to last us for thousands of years around the world. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a couple ways you can kind of do the math, but, but really thinking broadly from somewhat of a, like a geo statistical perspective, um, and I think I maybe made that word up, but <laughs> the geologically statistical perspective, there's enough uranium and thorium in the planet to power, you know, humankind at a 10 billion population uh, number using us per capita energy consumption right now for, for millions, if not billions of years. Wow. So, um, millions of years. so there's, there's no scarcity here of the no. zero carbon energy source. We just have to be not dumb enough to regulate it out of existence. Right. Right. And you know, at the end of the day, like 
this is one of those things where we have to think about the regulatory side to be efficient and effective in doing what it's supposed to do, right? It obviously plays a role in terms of ensuring adequate safety. That's its primary function, like adequate safety to the public. But it has to recognize that sometimes regulatory systems lock in older, less safe ways of doing things. There's interesting examples in the FAA mm-hmm. about that. I think some of the stories around some of the, like the 737 and the MAX issues and all that, you know, why is it so expensive on the plane side to bring forward new, why does it cost billions of dollars to bring a new plane into existence as better? So yeah, so you, you want regulation to, to protect us, but we also don't want it to hurt us. And especially given right. that we're taking climate change seriously, we need to think seriously about allowing us to solve climate change in other ways too. Right, regulation should not keep newer technologies a way that are better and, and are objectively better. And uh, the interesting thing is, you know, the regulatory agency, they're getting a lot better. They're doing a lot of transformation, modernization, but there's still more work that needs to be done, especially to realize that they have to approach these things differently and they can't fall back to keeping to doing this. Is, this is one way. of the biggest causes my wife and I work on is, is regulatory agencies and regulatory administrative state change. So we're fully aligned. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> huge impact. We're starting to see uh, a lot more startups in the nuclear space. Are we entering a new age of nuclear energy? Yes, I think we are. Because of those factors, this is an inevitability. And the thing we're working on is to accelerate it so that the future can be better sooner. Because why wait? Why wait for something that's inevitable? Like, let's do this now. And I think that's a big thing that's different about us sometimes than sort of the prevailing trends that have existed in this industry, where there's also a lot of cynicism, actually. It's like, oh, well, you can't license things. So you can't do things like that. And it's like, well, why can't we? And there's not actually a fundamental reason why you can't. You, you just have to do it. And you have to be willing to do things differently. And that's really what we kind of rolled well, up our what, what do. You, what do you need to be even in a bigger spot and say in 2030, like where are you going to be in 2030 and what can make it so it's even having a bigger impact? Yeah. I mean, you know, we like to think of, of what is an audacious goal that, that we want to work towards. And, and is it possible to build dozens of these reactors by that time frame? You know, what does it look like? How fast can we get maybe a hundred reactors out the door? Uh, you know, and I think those are goals that you think about the early 2030s. Those are things you can actually work towards and do. Um, so, so you want to, so have dozens of reactors by the end of the decade. What, but what, what can you do to make that go faster? Or what, what's your scarcity? Yeah, right now, I think our scarcity is, uh, is building out the supply chain to do it. So a big thing we're doing, when I say supply chain, I really mean it's like our internal manufacturing fabrication capabilities. So that's a big thing we're about to be growing. Where are you, where are you doing that manufacturing? Uh, we're working and talking with folks where we should do that. So it's, it's open right now. So if people want to have the future of energy in their states, let us know. <laughs> we, should, we, should, we should make sure you come talk to Texas. Yes. That's, that's something that's where we'd like to support that sort of thing there. Let me know. And then obviously we want to make sure you get as much capital as you need. Yes. Give us a sense, you know, if we fix how this regulation works, because it, it seems like it's already getting better because you're approaching it in the right way. And we build nuclear plants in America. What could our energy future look like by 2050? Yeah, I think you have an energy future that's, that's truly decarbonized um, in a meaningful manner. So not just like paying lip service to it. And in a way that's increased the res- basically the grid's resilience uh, reliability and affordability. I think we can dr- drive energy costs down and that's something that right now the trend lines are not moving towards, but I think that's something that can happen. And that's something that, that like in 2050, could this technology get to three cents? Could it get a kilowatt hour? Like, or could, yeah, it, I think at the end of the day, I mean, you, you know, that the cost of electricity coming out of these systems can be in that range. And then the cost people are paying can become a lot more stabilized. Cause right now you see places like, like here in California right now, I mean, re- well, it's not just in California, but in a number of states, you're seeing great deployment of clean technologies like solar and like wind, but energy prices are going up. Yep. Even though the prices of those well, these things, things are, are intermittent down. and they're expensive, exactly. they're more expensive. Uh, it, it seems to me that not only can we have you know entirely green network by 2050 with mostly nuclear, but we can actually, if we wanted to, we can be taking carbon out of the air very yes. cheaply because you have all this extra power that could be being used for carbon sequestration when it's not being used by other people because these plants are just running all the time. Why right. not power you know c- power decarbonizing? So things. I think you have a great system where you have a mix of you know different energy sources that are clean, that are cheap, that are reliably working together. And nuclear is kind of one of the anchor pieces of that, a foundational piece of that. Um, I think when you look at what that means, I mean, by 2050, I think you can be in that spot in the US in a, in a way that's like, just really addresses sort of what people are really concerned about right now in terms of assuring a clean energy mix, but bringing in reliability, resilience, and affordability to the play as well. Uh, and sets us up for, for centuries more growth like that. And, and I think, you know, even thinking beyond just here, one of the cool things about fission that's so neat is that we can obviously get a lot of energy out of something very small and you don't need air, you don't need water. The same thing opened up, you know, access to space in a different way. So I think that by that time frame, you're going to see, uh, basically nuclear systems powering, you know, human advancement in space so as clean well. clean power throughout the United States, throughout the world and, yeah. uh, and cheap energy <laughs> in space. Yep. Exactly. And, uh, and a very, a very green and prosperous future. That's, that's, that's exciting stuff. Thanks so much, Jake, for joining us. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here, Joe. Jake, we had a great conversation earlier and we were getting ready to release the episode and the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, announced that it had denied your application for the FAST reactor. 
Uh, I think it's important to give the audience an update on what happened, like what they say, and, and how are you guys responding? Yeah. <clears throat> so we uh, we were surprised to, to see that and, and, and kind of disappointed in, in the way the process was handled. But uh, uh, really, the sort of rationale provided and, and their justification for it was, was ultimately rooted in them wanting to see some new information. Uh, not new information, sorry, some more information that supported uh, their review. At the end of the day, this is something that's new, not just in technology, but in uh, application structure. They said there was insufficient information concerning potential safety risks. That was one of the things they said. Really? Yeah. I mean, if you think about what we're talking about here is when you do something new like this, you have to define, okay, what's what, what are the credible events that can happen and challenge a plan? Um, <clears throat> and we took, a, we took an approach that basically quantified and laid out how methodologically we approached that and how we selected those events. And they just want to have more basically honest case studies and examples work through on that. They want more case studies, but how do you have a case study without having built the damn thing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, this is one of the interesting challenges. Can, can you go is, build it in another country or something that's more permissive and then, and then show, show them it works? I mean, how, how does this work? You know, that becomes increasingly likely. I think fewer and fewer countries are willing to wait on the NRC. And I think we see that. Actually, it's been interesting. We've had uh, the biggest uptick in international interest since the denial, actually. Can you give examples of countries that are interested or is that secret? Yeah, just at a high level, countries ranging from Eastern Europe uh, to Central and South America. I hear in Eastern Europe, they, uh, they, they might not want to use uh, gas coming from their neighbor anymore. Yeah, right. They seem to be interested in energy <laughs> independence in a whole new way. I love it. So it is. It's it's creating an interesting environment there. It's also motivated. I think. Uh, I think one of the interesting things that comes out of these kinds of things is it motivates more attention on the regulator in a, in, a, in a positive way, right? I mean, Congress requested a GAO audit on the readiness. Clearly, people are paying attention on this. Well, well, I mean, you're talking about the regulator. My understanding is the NRC has been around in its current form since the '70s, and it's. I understand that it's never approved like a new type of design. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean the the. The talking point that is pretty crazy to think about is since the NRC was formed, uh, no plant that has submitted its initial original application to the NRC has ever come online. All the plants that are operating today submitted their applications, uh, their initially uh, their initial applications, sorry, to the Atomic Energy. So one Commission, one could be forgiven for thinking that they secretly were very against nuclear power, which they're supposed to be regulating it, but that one could, might think that they're actually secretly just don't want it to ha happen anymore. Yeah, I mean, when you bat zero percent for forty plus years, it raises those kinds of questions. And, and you, you think you think Congress is going to start looking and making some changes? I mean, is this who who appoints the head? Is the president appoint the head of this, or, or how does it work? Yeah, so the commission has five uh, presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed spots. Right now, there's two open ones that haven't been filled since uh, since President Biden took took uh, office. So we're looking forward to those getting filled. Um, and on top of that, Congress has passed bipartisan legislation driving modernization and transformation to the NRC starting back in 2018. I think there's a, uh, there's new bills that are circulating to continue to drive this forward. I think what we're seeing is people people are watching and people care, and they don't think that the status quo can continue, right? Like things have to change. You know, and I think what, what we've seen with our denial has been we've gotten, I think we've gotten pretty significant and improved engagement with the NRC since that. Um, there are good staff there who definitely want to work and have a successful So there, there are some people there who want to work. They're working with you. Do you have other applications with them right now as well? Are you waiting to refile or how does that work? Yeah. So right now we're going back to update the application, work with them to resolve some of the items that, that uh, we can before we resubmit and we'll resubmit again later this year. And then the nice thing is, you know, they've been pretty clear. They've said, said it publicly too, that their expectation is they'll be able to pick up the application where we left off. So we're not starting over from scratch. Uh, we can address some of the open items here, build on the things we've already done. One thing we have to also look at is while we were disappointed, we accomplished quite a bit in retiring a lot of regulatory, I would say, risk and also uncertainty uh, getting as far as we did. We, you know, some people in the, I mean, the nuclear industry itself is also largely to blame on this stuff, right? Typically speaking, they take incremental approaches. They take yeah. one step forward. We took a hundred. We took a hundred steps forward, right? People said everything we were doing could be impossible, like observers in the industry. And yet we got, you know, we got a lot of steps forward or we made a lot of steps forward already. Uh, and we're pretty close to the finish line. I, I don't think we're actually that far apart. So it may be the case you get it done with some good staff in the NRC. It may be the case you simultaneously pursue other countries you want to work with, Jake. Uh, what, That's exactly what, what we're doing. What, what, <laughs> one, one question I want to I want to end on. Uh, you know, I'm hearing about lots of other nuclear power stuff going on around the world. I hear there's thorium-based reactors in China. I'm curious if you're bullish on nuclear power more broadly. What else you're seeing that's happening? That's interesting. Yeah, I think, yes, I'm quite bullish broadly. I think what we're seeing in, in the last year and a half, there's been a significant uptake, especially in sort of <clears throat> Europe, uh, as well as where we've seen it already growing throughout the This is the rest like in France or, or what other places are doing more there? France, other, you know, Central Europe, the UK, Eastern Europe. 
there's just growing interest on this. People recognize the importance of the technology. People recognize that this is the future, that it's going here. And I think what we see is, is countries are also moving forward independently, right? They're not waiting on anybody else. They see this as important. My understanding is that a lot of the people who are against nuclear may have been aided by Russian propaganda. I know Russia, Russia paid a lot of money to stop fracking all around Europe, which is strongly in their interest. And it seems like they give a lot of money to environmental groups that are also against nuclear. Is, is that something you've encountered at all? Yeah, I mean, there's some there's some interesting historical, you know, documentation that shows the you know the Soviet Union and Russia funding an anti nuclear environmental like you know disinformation campaigns starting back in the 50s. Um, and there's some interesting stories there, you know, to dig into. I'm not super familiar with all the details, but the people who who've looked more into that, it's pretty. I mean, it's well, pretty, what what pretty I wild. what I found being from the intelligence world is that is that Putin continues to do this KGB nonsense around the world in other contexts. He continues to fund far left rallies in Central and South America causing trouble. I, I I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the, the anti-nuclear stuff's coming from, from, from frankly, rivals like him behind the scenes trying to trick people. Interesting. Well, you think about it too, right? Look at the international stage. Russia has had owned the international market. They had a quarter book of hundreds of billions of dollars in new plants. And, and we saw countries that were working with them trying to come to us and be like, hey, we want to do things faster. Um, but you know, the U S has, has kind of got some things that it, it's, it's getting better at in terms of how we can export. But the reality is, yeah, they've locked up a lot of orders and a lot of world demand that. And, and back to our question on the thorium reactors, is that like a smart thing for people to be doing? How do you think of thorium versus what you guys are doing and, and, and the differences? Yeah. I mean, thorium is something we can ultimately use. I think the big thing about thorium is where's the supply chain exists. Thorium is yeah. a fuel itself. Isn't directly usable. You have to put it in a reactor to make it usable. Yep. Um, and then when you do that, it becomes fuel. Uh, and there's some interesting pathways there. And for certain countries, there's a lot more thorium available than uranium to them. But right now, thorium supply chain isn't isn't really. But, but that's not that's not that's not the central central question is the design of the small reactor, which is what you're working on. Yeah, and at the end of the day, it's just it's one other form of fuel. So here's here's the way I think about thorium. Between thorium and uranium reserves, we could power the planet for well over 10 billion years. I mean, there's your answer for energy solutions. We have enough. Right? We that's, have enough. We have enough clean energy forever, basically. And this, yeah. So it's, yep. <laughs> you just got to get these things approved. Jake, I really appreciate it. Good luck pushing us ahead with the NRC. I look forward to staying updated. Thanks, Jeff.